Using the touch screen to operate the camera and navigate through the menus is quite intuitive, but it can be a bit slow and fiddly, especially if you've got big hands like me. Luckily, there's another option, as you can also operate the camera using the various buttons and dials on the body. And they're ergonomically designed to be very easy to access and use. So once you've gotten used to them, you'll find yourself using the touch screen less and less. And that can only be a good thing because it means that you'll have fewer greasy fingerprints all over your screen. So let's go over the camera's main buttons and dials. A good one to start with is the Q button, which is here. And this has the same functionality as the Q button, which is on the touch screen. So if I press this now, that will give us access to the quick control screen. To navigate the screen, all you need to do is use these four buttons around the set button, and they're called the cross keys. And then you press the set button when you want to select something. So let's just give that a go. If I press the Q icon, and then if I navigate up to white balance, let's just say it's a sunny day. So if I press set to select, and then I press to the sunny day icon, I could press the set button in the center to confirm my choice, but I don't have to. I can just start shooting straight away by pressing on the camera's shutter button like this. And then that would mean that my selection has been locked into place. On the back of the camera, just above the Q icon, we've got this other button, the AV button, which is an exposure control and has multiple functions depending on the shooting mode that you're in. In manual mode, this button allows you to change the aperture or the F number using this doll here on the front of the camera. In all the other creative modes, the button accesses the exposure compensation function, which means that you can use the dial to make your photos either brighter or darker. Now this dial here is one of the main controls on the camera's body. Without pressing the AV button, it adjusts the shutter speed, as I've already mentioned. But when you do press the AV button, these orange pointers on the monitor here shift from the shutter speed to the F number, like so. And then you can use this dial to adjust the F number. So if I do that left and right, you can see that number changes. If I were holding the camera normally like this, I'd be able to use my thumb to press all these buttons here, and then I'd use my index finger to adjust the main dial and to press the shutter button. In this way, it's possible to adjust all your essential settings like the aperture, shutter speed, and the ISO really quickly. You can even do this with the camera held up to your eye because the values are shown just under the image when you're looking through the viewfinder. Although these settings only appear when you press the shutter button halfway down to meter the amount of light in the scene. The first number is your shutter speed, the second is your aperture, then you've got the exposure level indicator, and then next to that is your ISO. And finally, the number at the end indicates the maximum number of photos that the camera can take in a continuous burst. In this case, the number is 9, which is the highest number that can be displayed here on this screen. Your maximum burst is actually much higher than 9. When the camera is set to JPEG, you can take anything between 20 and 40 continuous photos by just holding down your finger on the shutter button as long as you have the camera's drive mode set to continuous shooting. And I'll talk more about drive modes later on in this video. Okay, so going back to the body of the camera, this dial here is really useful as a quick way to make changes once you've got the quick control screen up. So let's just access the quick control screen by pressing on the Q button here. I don't know if you can see that. So if I press the Q button, you can see that the white balance icon has been highlighted. And that's because that was the last button that I was adjusting when I was on this screen. Let me just turn the dial now. Oh, let's press it again. Let me just turn the dial. Uh, as you can see, I'm scrolling through the different white balance presets without having to go into the menu. You still need to use cross keys here to navigate around the menu. So if I wanted to go to the quality of the image, I navigate over there, and then I can use the dial to adjust that, like so. Another essential button on the body of the camera is the ISO button, which is at the top of the front here. Press it and you go straight into the camera's ISO menu, allowing you to use any of the camera's navigation methods to make a selection. So you can use the scroll wheel, like so, or you can use the cross keys, like so, or you can use the touch screen and just press the selection that you want. Many buttons on the body of the camera have multiple functions. For example, these cross keys aren't just for navigation. They all have different functions attached to them. This top button directly accesses the white balance menu. So if I press it, we're taken into the white balance options. And then if I use the keys here, or if I use the scroll wheel, or if I touch on the screen, we can select various different white balance presets. Once you've got your setting selected, press the set button to go out of the menu. Okay, so what else do the cross keys access? This bottom one here takes you to your 
picture styles. The one over on the left here allows you to change your drive mode, and this one over here, the AF button, allows you to change your autofocus. AF focus changes the way your camera focuses when it's in autofocus, but it won't have any effect when this switch here on your lens is set to manual focus. So we need to switch it to AF, like so, for it to have any effect when we're using this button here. It also only works in creative zone modes, which are these four zones here. There are three autofocus choices. If I press the AF button now, I'll bring those up. So there are three different choices. Um, the first one is suited to still subjects, and that's called one shot. The second one is suited for moving subjects, and that's called AI focus. And the third one is a combination of the two, and it adjusts depending on what's happening in the scene between still shots and moving subjects. It's best to stick with the first option for now, which is called one shot. So if I click on that now, as the other two modes can be tricky to use and can take a while to master. All of the buttons I've just talked about access settings that can be adjusted on the touchscreen. Now I want to talk some more about the other buttons on the camera's body. The first one is here, and it's called the Live View button. When you press it, like that, the mirror inside the camera lifts up and you see a live view of what the lens is pointing at here on the monitor. This button is linked to the video functionality of the camera, and what you see on the screen is basically the same as what you see in movie recording mode. When you're in movie mode, this button becomes the camera's record button, but I'll talk more about that later. Live view is really useful because it shows you, at least to some degree, what your photograph is going to look like. The most important thing it shows you is exposure. To illustrate this, let me just change the exposure by adjusting the shutter speed. So if I underexpose the image, make it darker by dialing the shutter down. As you can see, the picture looks dark, and if I were to take a photograph, this is what you would get. So that's really underexposed. You can also see the results of changing your white balance, your ISO, and your picture style. None of these things are visible when you look through the viewfinder, which means it's really easy to make mistakes unless you know what you're doing. So using Live View can really help you out when you're starting out. Of course, there are downsides too. Live View is a big drain on the battery, and focusing can be a little bit slower. Live View also detaches you from the content of your photo, which, once you're up to speed with the technical side of things, is the thing that you should be concentrating on. Using the viewfinder gets you much closer to the content by isolating and framing your field of view, which is why it's still preferred by most photographers. When you're in live view, the settings and controls you can access are slightly different from normal. To illustrate, let's switch back to auto as it's a little easier to explain. So if I switch the dial to auto, if we press the quick control button now, like so, you can see that we've got more than just the drive modes to play with. We can also access image quality, which is over here. And on the other side of the screen, we've got the Creative Filters menu, which is this icon here. Creative Filters give you the option to add artistic styles to your images, such as grainy black and white or fisheye. Once applied, you can't remove these filters, so I'd recommend you steer clear of them here. If you do want to apply these looks, then you can apply them during playback, which I'll come to later. Because Live View utilizes the touchscreen, autofocus works in a slightly different way, which is why the Quick Control menu also has this extra option up here at the top. So if I press the Q, and there it is there. This is autofocus method. The default is the first option, which is this one here. The camera decides how you focus depending on what's in your shot. These white lines mark the area that the camera will analyze to achieve focus. And if there's a face in the shot, it'll pick that up. Using this autofocus method, you can also select a focus point by tapping on the touchscreen. The camera will track the point you've selected if it moves in the shot. And you can move the box around using the touchscreen or the cross keys. When you press the shutter button down halfway, the box around the point will focus and turn green. And the camera will beep to tell you that the focus has been achieved. It will turn orange if it can't achieve a focus. Let's turn to the second autofocus method now. So if I press the quick access button and then select the second one, which is called FlexiZone Multi. This tells the camera to focus on multiple points within the area marked by these white lines. You can narrow the focus by tapping the touch screen or by pressing the set button. Now you can move this box around the screen to concentrate on different areas. When you press the shutter button down halfway, the points in focus will show up as small green squares. Unfortunately, in this mode, the focus point won't track the subject it's locked onto. The third method, which is here, reduces the focus to just one of these small squares. By default, it's located in the center, but you can move it around anywhere on the screen using the cross keys. As with the previous method, the camera isn't able to track the subject. Then there's the last option, autofocus quick, which I'll just quickly 
go to. It's that fourth one there. Autofocus in live view takes a little bit longer than it does when you're using the viewfinder. This option uses the same autofocus method used in the standard viewfinder shooting, which makes it faster. But it's quite disturbing to use because it's noisy and the live view image gets turned off for a second while the camera refocuses. Of all these options, I'd say that the best one is the first one, so let's select that. You may have noticed there's also a magnifying glass down here in the corner, just there. This allows you to zoom in digitally on the scene, and it's useful if you want to check the accuracy of your focus. I won't demonstrate this in autofocus though, as it's really something that you'll find most useful when you're focusing manually. So let's switch to manual focus now, if I switch that there like that. Now we can press the magnifying glass icon on the screen, or I could use one of these buttons up here to digitally zoom in. Let's tap on the screen like that, and you'll see a white box appear in the centre. If I tap on it again, it will zoom in, and then if I tap on it one more time, it zooms in again. Now you can adjust the focus by dialing the focus wheel. Once you've got your focus nice and sharp, press the icon again, and you'll be back in normal shooting mode. There's one more additional function that opens up when you're in live view, and that's touch shutter. You enable it by pressing this icon down here at the bottom of the screen. If I tap on it now, you see that touch shutter has been enabled. Touch shutter allows you to take a photo by just touching the screen, but I'd recommend that you avoid this function because it's hard to control, so let's just turn that off again. There you go, that's disabled. There are a few things your camera won't show you about your photo when you're in live view mode. One of these is depth of field. We've already mentioned depth of field, it refers to the area of the scene which appears to be focused in relation to the area that appears out of focus. So if you have a look at this photo, you'll notice that the foreground is in focus and much of the background is very blurry. This photo has a shallow depth of field. In comparison, this photo has a deep depth of field. As you can see, it's less blurry and more of the background now appears in focus. Depth of field is affected by how much you've zoomed in and the size of your aperture or F number. If you want to see what you're going to get, then you can press this little button here at the front of the camera whilst looking through the camera's viewfinder. So that's the live view button. Another important button on the body of the camera is this one here, info. This changes the amount of information that you can see in the viewfinder. You can scroll through the various information screens, whatever you're doing with the camera, whether you're in live view mode, like we are now, or using the viewfinder in movie shooting mode or in playback mode. To show this works, let me just switch to manual because we can see more information on the screen in that mode. OK, so if I press the information button, you can see different screens have different amounts of information about the camera settings. So if I go to that one there, on this one things like white balance and picture style are displayed. And on this one here, you can see that there's also a histogram which shows the distribution of brightness in your image. And that's another way that you can make sure that your exposure is OK. This side of the histogram shows how many dark pixels there are, and over on this side it shows how many bright pixels there are. So if I shift the image slightly, you'll see that move. What you want is a good, even distribution all the way across the chart. And you want to avoid readings in the extreme ends because that would mean that part of your image is completely black or completely blown out white. Let me just press the button again. We'll go back to our original information screen. There we go. Before we move on, there are two more buttons on the body of the camera that I want to mention quickly. The first one is here at the front, and that's your depth of fill button. It allows you to see how much depth of fill your photo is going to have, but it only works when you're in one of the creative zone modes. This last button here, it also only works when you're in a creative mode, and that's the flash button. If I were to press it, the flash flips open like so, and if I were to take a photo now, the flash would go off. To turn it off, you just simply press it down and click it into place. In any of the basic zone modes, the flash button doesn't work. Even if you were to keep the flash physically open, it still wouldn't be activated unless the camera thought it was necessary.